Hey guys, welcome back to another video on Microsoft Orleans. In this video, we're going to take a look at stateless worker grains and how we can use them in our system to improve our system performance. In the previous video, we took a look at streaming and we're going to continue to build our banking application in this video. If you're enjoying the series, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to be updated of the latest videos. We still have a couple more videos left in this series and we'll be doing other video series on other application and distributed application development topics in the future. So by default, Orleans only creates a single activation of our grain across a cluster. This generally makes the most sense as it follows the actor-based program model most closely that a single logical entity in our system can only do one thing at a time and only lives in one place, only has one identity. However, there are cases where we might want to perform some operations which are generally stateless and not tied to a specific entity. For example, we might want to do some work like compression or decompression that isn't related just to that entity in question. Or for instance, we might just want to do some coordination work between grains that doesn't need to be performed on a specific grain. We can achieve this by adding a stateless worker attribute to the grain. So when a grain has this attribute, multiple activations of the grain can be created on all applicable silos. So say we have these two silos here, and we've got these number of grains that we've seen previously. We've got a couple of account grains and a couple of customer grains. Orleans will activate these grains across our silos, depending on our configuration. So in this case, one of our silos has the two account grains because it's configured to only use accounts or only activate account grains. All the other one has both account and customer grains. We then might have these stateless worker grains that don't have defined identity. Requests to these grains will use the local version of the grain where possible, saving on serialization and network calls. If we're in a situation where a certain stateless grain on a specific silo is experiencing high load, then the cluster might decide to spin up another instance of this grain to share the load. The max number of stateless worker grains that can live in a silo is configurable by the developer. So as we said, stateless worker grains are not individually addressable. If we make a request to a stateless worker grain, there's no mechanism that guarantees which activation of the grain will handle the request. Our first request from account grain A might be processed by stateless worker one, but a second request might be processed by stateless worker two. We really don't know. However, using these mechanisms, we can create a stateless pool of workers that can scale up or down based on the load they are under. New instances are only created when the runtime detects that it has received a request, but all activations are currently busy and we are also less than the configured maximum stateless worker limit. Similar approach to this happens when request numbers are low, Orleans automatically starts to deactivate our stateless workers. Despite the name stateless worker grains actually can have state, the only difference is that this state is not guaranteed to be consistent on call to call, as we can never be sure on which activation we are going to hit. We can store something on a stateless grain, but there's no guarantee we'll be able to retrieve it in the next call. However, because of their local scalable nature and ability to store state, stateless worker grains actually can be pretty useful to operate as hot cache storage, which does not require network or even disk calls in the most optimal situations. In our application, we're going to use a stateless worker grain to coordinate transfers between one account and another. So now we're back in Visual Studio and let's make a couple of changes to add a stateless worker grain to our silo. This stateless worker grain is just going to run a transaction that debits one account, credits another account. It's also going to have a little bit of state that just counts the transaction count that that specific activation of the stateless worker grain has processed. There's not the total amount of transactions in our system. It's just really to demonstrate that a stateless worker grain can actually have some state and just show how we can access it and use it. So we don't need to change anything in our silo. Stateless worker grains are supported out of the box with the packages we already have. But we do need to add some changes in our grains. And most of these changes are just the same as adding any other grain with one or two subtle differences. So we're just going to add a class to store the state of our grain. And we're just going to call this transfer state. And it's simply just going to store a count of transfers. So public int transfer account. And we want to add a getter and a setter. And we also want to make this serializable. So we will add the generate serializable attribute on the class. 
and the ID attribute on the property, as well as making it a public record. Perfect. So now that we've added the transfer state, as usual, the next thing we want to do is we want to add the interface for our grain to use. So we'll add the new class, we'll call it I stateless transfer processing grain. We'll create that. It's obviously an interface, not a class. We'll make it public. And as usual, we need to also implement the I grain with something key. In this case, we'll just go for integer key. And then we want to add the method we want to use. So we're just going to do a simple process transfer method. And it's going to take a from account ID as a parameter, a to account ID, thanks for auto complete there, and a amount. And that's it. That's our grain interface defined. Again, nothing different from a usual grain. Only difference is we decided to use an integer key here. Okay, so final thing we want to do is actually create the grain itself and implement the method. So we'll call it stateless transfer processing grain. As usual, we want to inherit from the abstract base class grain and we want to implement the I stateless transfer processing grain. Perfect, we'll make the class public. We will add a quick constructor and we'll implement the interface. Now remember, we're using some state here, so we want to inject that in our constructor, and it's just a normal state, not a transaction state, so we'll just say I persistent, persistent state, we give it the generic type of the state we have, which is just the transfer state. Perfect, and we'll just call it transfer state. Cool, and we want to attribute that with a persistent state to tell it the name of the state, which we'll just call transfer and where it's going to be stored. And that is going to be the same as where we store the, say, customer grain. So in table storage here. So let's jump back. Let's finish this off and close those braces. Cool, and then we'll just store that in a private read-only variable like anything we inject. I persistent state called transfer state and with the underscore and we'll assign it in our constructor. Super. And then in our process transfer, let's actually test, think about what we want to do here. We want to get two grains. We want to get the from account of grain. We want to get the to account of grain. And then we want to debit one and credit the other one. But if you remember in our checking account grain, we previously made these debit and credit be as part of a creator join transaction. So in order for this to work, we need to pass a transaction context to these debit and credit methods. And to get that transaction contracts, we also need to use a transaction client. So this is going to be similar to what we did in the ASP.NET client in one of the methods for withdrawal from the API. But now we're just going to do it in this stateless worker grain. So inject the transaction client, save it as a private read only variable, transaction client, and then assign that in the constructor, easy peasy. Cool, so we should have everything we need in terms of stuff injected in the constructor. Just gonna get rid of some of those unused usings. Let's do the work in our process transfer grain. So first thing first, let's get reference to these two grains. So from account grain, and we'll use the grain factory that we can use because we inherited from the abstract grain class get grain, we know it's a checking account grain, and we know the ID is from account ID, and we also want to get the two one. So same thing, except from is changed to two in both places. Okay, now we want to do the transaction itself. So we want to say transaction client dot run transaction. What type of transaction is it? It's a brand new one, we're creating it here. So we want to create it, and then we want to add the Lambda where we actually perform the transaction. So inside there, we want to debit one account, we want to credit the other one. So we want to credit the two accounts grain, I believe. And we want to credit with the amount from the parameter in the method. And on the from one, we just want to debit that one with the amount as well. Easy, 
nothing massively different here. Same thing we did in the withdraw from ATM method in the ASP.NET client. And then finally, we just want to update the transfer state. I just want to show that this is the exact same as a non-stateless grain. So transfer state, state, transfer account plus equals one. And then we just want to write that back. So I'm going to say await transfer state, right on the transaction client, write state async. And that should write it to our storage. And remember, we're just writing it for this activation of the grain. There's no guarantee that this transfer count will be the total number of transfers that our system has performed or anything like that. It's really just to demonstrate that we use this in the same way in a stateless worker grain. And speaking of stateless worker grains, we've forgotten the main and most important thing, which is the stateless worker attribute up here from Orleans concurrency. And that just marks this as a stateless worker grain. If we wanted to limit the number of activations we can have, we actually do that in here. So you can see max local workers, we can pass tree, 10, whatever you want. So that's where we would actually say we only want three local workers. If we leave it blank, Orleans will scale up to as many as it deems appropriate. So that's everything we need to do in the grains. Let's jump to our client and add a quick API call to actually run this stateless transfer processing grain and the process transfer method. So first thing we wanna do is just wanna add a very quick transfer contract on our API. And this will be a record. We want to make it serializable with data contract and we want to use data member for our properties. So we need the account ID, the two account ID. And then we need some other ones. I'll just copy this because the second one is just from, so that's basically the same. And the other one is amount. And that's our API contract there, everything we need to actually run the transfer. Final bit is add in the program CS where all our API calls live, is we wanna add the actual API call to do the transfer. And we're just gonna copy the add checking account one we added in the last video, change it slightly to process the transfer. The root will just be transfer, nothing else in the root. We don't have any root parameters, we can get rid of customer ID. The contract will just change to transfer that we already just defined. A second ago, we just need the cluster client. We don't need a transaction client in the client anymore because now the transaction is being created inside our silo in the stateless worker grain. So the ASP.NET client doesn't need to have any idea that it's using transactions anymore like it did in the withdrawal here. So that runs a transaction, it does the transaction logic in here, but we've actually moved that now into this stateless worker grain. Okay, so we wanna get the stateless worker grain the same way we get any other grain. So the stateless transfer processing grain, let's change the variable name and let's call process transfer on that. And that needs to be passed some variables. The first one being the from account ID and we'll get that from the API contract. Second one being the to account ID and the third being the amount of the transfer all from that API contract. And the final thing that we actually need to do here and pretty importantly is this customer ID. So we don't have an ID for a stateless transfer processing grain, but when we get the grain, we do need to pass some ID. So what do we pass here? Well, the answer is pretty simple. We can pass, I think whatever we want. And in my case, I generally just pass zero and that will just let Orleans choose which stateless worker grain that this transfer will go to. If we passed a different value like one, again, Orleans would just choose for us. We really have no control over where it goes, no matter what we add here in this method call. All right, so let's run this quick transfer in Postman. Let's just make sure everything is working as we would expect. Okay, so let's run our cluster here and let's call this API endpoint for transfer that we added. And again, obviously we wanna make sure we're running Azure right here and our cluster starts successfully. Everything looks good. We're starting on localhost 7257. That's what our API is on. Let's jump into Postman. Again, I've added these calls already. 
we'll use some of the ones we added before just to create some initialized accounts. We'll create an account with a balance of 10,000. Get the ID from the response headers. And then we'll go to the stateless transfer, which is really just dash transfer. We'll copy in that to account ID as one of the accounts we want to use. And we'll create a second account again, just calling the same API again. So both of these accounts will have 10,000 euro in them. Back to the stateless transfer and let's put that in there. And let's say we want to do a 4,000 euro transfer. So if we get the checking account balance using the calls we added in previous videos, the balance of both of these should be 10,000. Perfect, the first one is. And let's just check the second one. And one more time, apologies for the small text size in Postman. I will copy this collection into the video description link. Both of them are 10,000. Let's perform this stateless transfer and see what happens. So 204, no content, looks like it was successful. This account, as you can see now, is 6,000 euro in it. Let's go back to our transfer call and get the other account ID we used. They should have 14,000, I believe. So it looks like our transfer worked successfully and this stateless worker grain is processing our transfers for us. If you can see, I've actually added two stateless transfer API calls here. I'm not gonna do it here, but feel free to mess around at your same time and just demonstrate that this grain can actually process two transfers at once. Obviously you need to use different account IDs on each transfer because the grain will block if it receives two requests. The account grains obviously can only process one request at a time if they're not marked as re-entrant. So thanks for watching this video, guys. I hope you enjoy the content around stateless worker grains. If you're enjoying the video series on Orleans, we still have a couple of videos left. So definitely hit that subscribe button and the notification bell as well to get notified when those new videos come out or keep up to date with other video series we have on other distributed application development topics. Thanks for watching.